a little clogged up today, so I can't quite tell if I'm being loud or quiet. Uh, we'll be going to the book of Romans, though, chapter 6. No, I don't. I can't even always understand why God does things the way he does, and so on and such, but I do know that scriptures say he has his way in the whirlwind and the storm and the cloud of the dust of his feet. Amen. Whatever it is, we know God is still in control. Amen. <laughs> Romans chapter 6, verse 4 through 6, Lord, we're going to look at today. From our last lesson, remember, we talked a lot about baptism, what it symbolizes. Verse 3, tell, Paul poses a question asking, Do you not know that as many were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? <clears throat> And we pick up in verse 4, he says, Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, and henceforth we should not serve sin. Amen. <coughs> we begin this first four by therefore, or because we have been baptized into his death, the death of Christ. He says, therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death. That it, just as Christ died and was buried, so we in type were died and were buried with him as well. Amen. When we died to sin, we died to self, if we were saved. And this is what baptism is symbolizing, that we have put off the old man, as we'll see. We have died with Christ, and we've been buried. Not only did we, did we die in Christ, but we also died to sin and dying in Christ. Amen. In Adam, we saw that we were dead in sin, but in Christ, we died to sin. Mm -hmm. Turn to 1 Peter 2.24 for just a moment. <clears throat> 1 Peter chapter 2. go back to verse 21, we'll get a little context here. It says, For even here unto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow his steps. Then he begins to describe Christ in his perfectness and his suffering as well. He says, Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judges righteously. Who in his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sin, should live unto righteousness by whose stripes you were healed. Amen. That Christ, he says, bore our sins there on the tree or on the cross, as we would call it. But notice he says that we, being dead to sin, should live unto righteousness. <laughs> Back in the earlier part of Romans 6, he says, How shall we there dead to sin live any longer therein? That we, in Christ, died to sin, and we should not live a life of sin any longer. Amen. So, not getting ahead of ourselves, but we, yes, we will struggle with sin in this flesh, but sin should not have control over us any longer. That in Christ, we have died to that having sin, having dominion over us. <coughs> that in Christ we were to die to self as well, and the self pleasing of the flesh. When times passed, we walked according to the course of this world, according to the lusts and desires of the flesh, Paul describes us. But we that have been saved are no longer to walk according to that way any longer. He says, 
that we were buried with him by baptism into death. And he goes on to say that like, that like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father. We, we talk a whole lot about the death of Christ and what it did for us, but sometimes I think we leave off the resurrection, and that's an important factor as well. Amen. Yes, Christ died for us. Yes, Christ in his death paid the penalty for sin for us. Yes, he was a perfect sacrifice, but yet he didn't stay dead. He didn't stay in the tomb. Amen. I think that's one thing that the, the Catholics often miss is that he didn't stay on the cross. He didn't right. stay dead, but he is the living Savior. That's right. He describes himself in Revelation. He is he which was alive and was dead and was alive forevermore. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Acts chapter 2, verse 24 tells us that it was not possible that death could hold him. Amen. Philippians 3.21 tells us that in the resurrection that Christ now possesses a glorious body. You know, in his humanity, he put on a, a body of flesh that was like unto sinful flesh. Right. He appeared as a Jewish man and no doubt took on the form of what woman looked like at his time. Right. Isaiah describes him as having no comeliness, and when we should desire him, there was no beauty that, or when we should see him, there was no beauty that we should desire him. But yet, in his resurrection, he put on, he says, a glorious body. Uh, he really robed himself in a body that was full of the glory of God. <coughs> well, if you recall, the, those on the road to Emmaus, they walked and talked with him. They didn't even recognize who he was. Right. Yeah. Well, in that same fashion, we shall be in the resurrection with him. Mm -hmm. As it says that we, just as we were baptized into death, we, like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, and so we should walk in newness of life. But, and without the resurrection, we would still be in our sins, according to 1 Corinthians 15. It says the dead in Christ, they would have perished, and we would be of all men most miserable. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 17, right? 18. <clears throat> and without the resurrection, there would be no hope past this life. That's right. The baptism also pictures this, that we were... We died with Christ, we were buried with Christ, but also that we rose again with Christ. Mm -hmm. I know we we don't believe that baptism is what saves a person, but I think sometimes we do downplay its symbolism and its importance mm -hmm. as a type in the life of a child of God. That, it, that it's basically us identifying ourselves with the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Wow. It's us publicly displaying that yes, we have in Christ we died, in Christ we live, and in Christ we live again. <coughs> As he says here, even so we should walk in newness of life. Yes, we died to sin in Christ, but even greater than that, in Christ we are made alive once again. Ephesians 2 verse 1 tells us that we were dead in trespass and sin, but he quickened us. Amen. That God gave us life even though we were dead spiritually. And that is what the resurrection is a great hope of, that one day we shall live eternally with him. When in Christ we are given a new life and we should live, and it says here we should walk in this newness of life, we should walk in such a way that it reflects that we have been given this new life. Amen. <coughs> Let's go over to Galatians chapter 5. Well, I've never been in this predicament from a physical standpoint where I've been given a second chance on life, but I'd say most people who have, they 
They view life differently afterwards, don't they? Mm -hmm. But spiritually, that's exactly what we've been given. We've been given a, a second chance at life, if you will. Yet we should view that in the light of that. We should walk our walk, we should live our lives in the light that we have been given a second chance at life, if you will. Galatians 5, verse 16 says, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Amen. That sounds simple, but it's a lot harder to do. But we that have been made alive in Christ, we are to walk in the Spirit. John chapter 3 tells us that it is the Spirit which causes us to be born again. <laughs> to be born again literally means to be born again of God. Amen. But the Spirit is the one who gives us life, and we are to walk in Him. Because if we do that, we will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And that is what this newness of life is about, not walking in our old ways, not walking in the ways of the flesh. Verse 20. Five says, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Amen. If we are Christ, if we've been born again, we've been saved, and we live in the Spirit. We live by the Spirit, if we will. We live because we have the Spirit of God indwelling within us. We should walk accordingly, he says. We should walk in the flesh and after the Walk in the spirit and after the spirit, not in the flesh and after the flesh. <clears throat> we, we, I know we don't like this as much as sovereign grace people, but we can either follow the flesh or we can follow the spirit when we're saved. We can, if we're not careful, we will follow after the flesh and do the things of the flesh. Mm -hmm. But it ought not to be so for the child of God. We have been called to walk in a way that is pleasing to God. Titus tells us that the grace of God teaches us to live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Amen. <clears throat> we go back to Ephesians 2. Ephesians we're going really to start in verse 1. It says, When you have to be quickened, you were dead in trespasses and sins. <clears throat> Notice verse 2. He says, Where in times past you walk according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirits are now working in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past, and the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. That is what the old man represents. Amen. That is what we were before God saved us. And yet, now, being made alive in Christ, we should walk in this newness of life. We shouldn't walk anymore according to the course of this world. We shouldn't walk anymore after the lust and desires of the flesh. <laughs> if I, I have a, I know, a big question about those who profess to be saved and they never live a life under God. Right. Amen. So the grace that saves us is the same grace that can change us, one brother said. When we've been given a new life in Christ, we are to live according to that new life. As we saw back earlier in Romans 6, grace is not a license to sin. It's not just because we've been saved by grace and we're free from the law doesn't mean we're free to live however we want to. Right. And we've been called into liberty, but we're, he says only use not this liberty for the occasion or for an occasion to the flesh. So mm -hmm. For an opportunity for the flesh to we might say that we might not live in a way that fulfills the lusts and desires of the flesh. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let's go back to our text and we'll go on here in verse 5, Romans chapter 6. <clears throat> he continues on the same thought, really for quite a few verses. In verse 5 he'll say, For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, and Paul is not saying that 
maybe we get in plan in the likeness of this, but he's saying if you have been, then this is the result here in the next part. If you've been planted in the likeness, or together in the likeness of his death, he says, we shall also in the likeness of his resurrection. You shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. If you've truly been saved, if you've truly died with Christ, you shall also live with Christ. If you truly die with him, we now live with the only, we can only live in and through him. But yet one day we shall be raised just as Christ was raised. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, I know we we all possess physical life here today, but spiritually we can only live in and through Christ. Amen. But one day we will experience that physical resurrection as well. 1 Corinthians 6 verse 14 tells us that the same power of God that raised up Christ shall also raise us up. 1 Corinthians 6, or excuse me, 1 Corinthians 15 verses 51 through 54 describe that day in which we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Amen. In the of an eye. And this corruptible shall put on incorruption, and this mortal shall put on immortality. And then shall be brought past the same death is swallowed up in victory. Yes, our, our baptism represents our dying with Christ, and our burying with Christ, and our being made alive again in Christ. Or, and certainly we have spiritual life as well. And one day we will experience the fullness of that when we put on Amen. that new body, that body that's made like unto his glorious body. Philippians chapter 3 tells us that he shall change our vile bodies unto one like unto his glorious body. <laughs> no more of this sickness and pain and suffering anymore. And that will be the, the fulfillment, if you will, of being like unto his resurrection. Mm -hmm. But we can only participate in the likeness of his resurrection if we've first been partakers in his death. Mm -hmm. And that's where many today, I think, miss the boat. They think that they'll, all these other things are going to save them, that they're their good works are going to save them, or somehow their baptism is going to save them. But they really think that when they get to heaven, God's going to let them in. But no, we must be partakers in His death. We must die to sin and to self. Amen. And yes, our, our baptism is a, a picture of all of this of, of dying and burying and being risen again. And that's just another reason why we baptism must be by immersion because you don't bury people by sprinkling them in dirty and pouring a little dirt over them. That's right. But you can be sure if you have died in Christ, one day you shall experience that full glory and living with Him for all of eternity as well. <laughs> that is where our great hope comes from as the children of God. That mm -hmm. This life is not all that there is. That it doesn't just end when we're at the grave, as some teach. Amen. But then one day we shall be called to meet him in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Paul writes to the Thessalonians. Let's go on to verse 6 here. We'll try to bring this to a close. Verse 6 says, Knowing this, he writes this, and assuming that the, the Romans should already know this, and that we should know it as well. But what he's about to say here, we have been crucified with him. But do we really know that? We sometimes forget that we've been made a new creature in Christ. Right. The old man has been crucified with him. I think sometimes we're prone to, to live after the old man rather than after the new man, don't we? Mm -hmm. We're prone to say, well, I'm still a sinner, so God's not going to worry about that. Certainly it's true that we still have the flesh to contend with, but we ought not use that as an excuse. <clears throat> he says, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him. That is the old nature, the, that corruption and wickedness that ruled us before we were saved. He said it's been crucified with Christ. Uh, that 
When Christ died on the cross, that old man died with him. We are no longer under the bondage of that old nature that we once were. Amen. We don't need to be discouraged and when we struggle with sin. We need to really take comfort in knowing that that old man has been crucified with Christ. Knowing that one day he will be fully put off. <coughs> Let's go to Galatians once again. Galatians chapter 2. And then we'll look at verses chapter 5 as well. Galatians chapter 2 verse 20. Paul right here, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. Amen. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. And that old man said he, he died with Christ, and we are to live this new life in and through Christ. And he says here, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. If we are living for ourselves, then we're not living for Christ, are we? Right. You know, this new life which we've been given in Christ, it should be really fully dedicated for Christ and the cause of Christ. The life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. This life which we're living now is not <coughs> really doesn't belong to us, does it? It belongs to Christ. Right. Maybe it's our American culture where we seem to live so much of life about self and self-fulfillment and self-enjoyment and doing things that are pleasing to the flesh and yet being given a new life in Christ, we're supposed to live that life completely for Him. Right. Galatians 5, 24 says... And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with affections and lust. That if we are truly have been born again, if we really belong to Christ, and he says we crucified the flesh. We, really we hung on the cross there just as Christ was crucified. That, that old man doesn't have control over us anymore. Amen. And that is one of the blessed privileges of being a child of God is that the, the old man, the old nature, the sin which controls us, it doesn't have that control over us anymore. You, know, you might say, well, I still struggle with sin. We'll get to that eventually in our study here in Romans. But this flesh has not yet been perfected, so we right. still struggle with sin. But that new man that is within us, First John writes, it cannot sin because it is born of God. And that is why we can say with Romans 8 verse 1 that there is therefore now no condemnation of them that are in Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. that, that new spiritual man within us, he does not sin. He does not he is not controlled by sin. He does Amen. not live a life according to sin. Back in our text it says that <coughs> The old man was crucified with him that the body of sin might be destroyed. You know, some say that this is referring to the old man, some to sin in general, but whichever it may be, it has been destroyed, he says. It's been made inoperative and active, no longer has power, force, or influence over us. That sin no longer has dominion over us, according to verse 14 of Romans 6 here. If we that have truly been born of God, we, yes, we may have sin, we may struggle with sin, but we, it is no longer the controlling factor in our lives. Amen. John 8, 34 tells us that if we commit sin, we are the servant of sin. Here in our text, he says that the body of sin might be destroyed, that we should, that henceforth we should not serve sin. That, 
going forward, we should not serve sin any longer. <coughs> really, from the time that Christ saved us, when we died in Him and we were given that new life, we were not to serve sin any longer. We're no longer to be the, the slave of sin, what it literally means. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that we won't struggle with that daily. Like 1 Corinthians 15, 31, Paul says, I die daily. Every day we have to kill the old man, if you will. Amen. We have to put off those old things and put on the new man. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 4. We'll come to a conclusion here. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 22 through 24. put off concerning the former conversation the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Amen. It goes on in verse 25, it says, Wherefore put away lying, speaking every man truth to his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be ye angry and sin not, but not the sun go down upon your wrath, you give place to the devil. Let him that still will steal no more, rather let him labor, working with his hands the things which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good in the use of edifying, that it might, may minister grace unto the hearers, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed on the day of redemption. Amen. So you will all say, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Amen. <coughs> if we're commanded to put off the old man and to put on the new man, that must mean that there's a chance that we won't do that. <laughs> we will heed rather to the old man rather than to the new man. That is the struggle for the child of God. That's a whole other lesson for another time. The old man versus the new man. The, our old nature versus our new nature and how it struggles within us. Right. But we have to continually put off the old man and put on the new man. But in Christ we have that victory over the old man. We have a victory over sin itself even. I think if we're not careful we'll live We'll too easily live in a defeated mindset, though. And we'll just say, well, that's the way it's going to be. Try. You know, I've got the flesh to contend with, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to sin. Hmm. <laughs> no, don't be discouraged when you do sin, but don't be content when you do sin either. That's right. Amen. So Christ has given us really victory and power over sin, that we should no longer be the servants of sin any longer. Right? That doesn't mean we will not have to struggle with it. doesn't mean the temptation won't come our way. Doesn't, being saved isn't a magic switch that's flipped and then all of a sudden all our problems go away. If anything, it's quite the opposite. Mm -hmm. Because then we become aware of our sin, we become aware of our, the wickedness that is within us. Well, I would say if sin doesn't bother you, you either are very far from God or not saved at all. Right. Sin should cause us to grieve. It should cause us to, to cry out to God for his forgiveness and for his help. Amen. But don't be discouraged when sin comes your way. But at the same time, don't be complacent and say, well, I guess that's just how it's going to be. As we'll see later on in chapter 6 of Romans, we can yield ourselves to, as instruments of righteousness or we can yield ourselves as instruments of sin. We must do one or the other. We can't have it both ways. But be sure that in Christ we have power over sin. He doesn't have to control us any longer. If we've been made a new creature in Christ, 
That old man doesn't have to rule and reign our lives any longer. Amen. But one day, just as Christ was raised from the dead and put on, glory, put on a glorious body, one day we will do the same. We shall be called up to meet him in the air and we'll put off that old man and sin completely and we'll put on the new man fully and this corruptible will be made incorruptible and this mortal will be made immortality. Amen. Death and sin will be no more. And that is the great hope that we have to look forward to as a child of God. <laughs> we ought to rejoice in what the death of Christ did for us, but we also all rejoice in what the resurrection of Christ has for us. Mm -hmm. I'm going to close this with that thought. Yep.